Kicking off the list at number 10, Ancient Exercise. Athletic gear today is amazing. We have shoes that correct your stride while you're running. We have backpacks filled with water. We have clothing now designed to keep you cool. How does it even, what? It's quite impressive stuff, but just how did ancient civilizations do it? What did we do before New Balance opened? You know what I mean? Well, ancient Greeks, believe it or not, used to work out naked. Completely naked, just butt nude. The word gymnasium actually translates to the Greek term gymnasion, which meant school for naked exercise. That sounds like a pretty insane school. Xavier's school for gifted youngsters, or Ezekiel's school for naked exercise. Mm, how do we pick? Naked exercise? That's the worst place to see naked people, in my humble opinion. Should I go to the squad rack? Ooh, no, maybe not. I don't know. Hey man, do you mind spotting me? Actually, never mind. I'm actually good. Thanks. Number nine, Egyptian tomb curses. The walls of Egyptian tombs are fascinating. The painting or sometimes carvings were meant to create a peaceful afterlife for those who had passed on. Pharaohs were buried with their treasure, favorite foods, everything wealthy that they owned. They believed they could take all of that with them to the afterlife. This belief, of course, welcomed grave robbers. So, in order to prevent any Nicolas Cage national treasure hunters to come snooping by with their flashlights, many of these tombs had curses written on the walls. This one is warning trespassers that gods will wring their neck like that of a goose. Also, if I walked into somebody's property nowadays and it said trespassers' necks will be wrung out like a goose, I would leave. I would turn around immediately. You don't have to be an ancient Egyptian god to get that message across. I'm good. Also, buried in Mastaba, inside the found tomb of Ankhmahor, a pharaoh official from 4,000 years ago, a curse was written. Might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It also warns of Ankhmahor's knowledge of secret spells and magic, and threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing ghosts. Again, there's that, or there's beware of dog. Number eight. Dung beetles. Ah, yes, dung beetles, the poop beetles, also known as scarabs. They're the only species in the entire world that instinctively follow the Milky Way. They just know to follow the Milky Way. How insane is that? You know how some animals just know to do things like sea turtles when they're hatched, they immediately sprint to the ocean to avoid, you know, being plucked by giant seabirds. They know to go towards the sea naturally. These beetles would naturally follow the line of the Milky Way and they would at the same time roll their poop towards it for some reason. First species in the animal kingdom to do this. So are dung beetles trying to phone home why does their planet need so much poop? Why are they rolling it towards the cosmos? Does Thor need this? Does Odin need all this Symbols of these beetles are seen either in hieroglyphics in Egypt, but also near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, there's a massive dung beetle monument. A poo-poo bug monument. Look at this thing, it's beautiful. There's even a legend still to this day behind the statue that if you walk around it nine times, you would find health, wealth, and love. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which at the time, Egyptians believed was the sun. I grew up thinking the sun was a baby. Thanks, Teletubbies. Number seven. Weak wine. When we think of ancient Greeks, we think of wine and parties and apparently naked exercise, right? But was it really a drunken festival of love all the time? Do they rock and roll all night and party every day? Ancient Greeks rarely drank wine without diluting the hell out of it first. The water to wine ratio was something like four to one. Four to one, that's insane. That's basically just water. That's crystal light you're drinking. I guess it's a good thing because you don't have to worry about waking up at 4 a.m. dehydrated. The ancient Greeks believed that drinking undiluted wine could cause blindness or insanity. Again, I think that's just called being drunk and maybe blacking out. I don't know. The 4th century poet Amphis had your back though. The best way to cure those ancient hangovers, according to thee, was to boil cabbage. And in order to keep the party going without embarrassing yourself after drinking too much sparkling Merlot, the key, apparently, was to bake and eat a pig's lung. That's the trick to never getting drunk. Again, I think that's just food that helped here in this situation. Either way, if you're gonna drink, do so responsibly. Number 6. Greek statues. We've all done it at one point, okay? You're at a museum, you see the statue in front of you. It's massive, the dude has like 16 abs, he's made of bronze, he's 12 feet tall. The amount of detail gone into their body and all those muscles, it's jaw dropping to say the least. Their fingernails, their dimples, muscles everywhere. But did you know ancient Greeks would make statues, uh, you know, they're, they would make that small on purpose. Men who were, you know, well endowed were more often than not fools. They only ruled for lust. If you had a big brain, however, oh, buddy, you were the talk of the town. They would whisper in the wind as you pass by. I heard Alexander has a massive brain. <laughs> Have you seen his brain? Whenever an actor would play a fool on stage, they would be given a comedically large setup. That's how you know he's the fool slash villain. The way we see these statues today of these ancient rulers, it meant that they had self-control and intelligence. This whole time I thought they were just in a cold room, but you know what, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help. Hit that like button. I'm here to historically help you on your statue knowledge. Number five. 
2020 mummies. Yeah, as if 2020 wasn't stressful enough, here's some more. Turns out we also found a lot of mummies. I'm glad Brandon Fraser is returning to Hollywood because sounds like we might need him to suit up again real soon. I don't know. Back in 2020, while we were stuck inside watching Netflix, more than 100 sealed coffins were found in Egypt. These findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations like Persians and ancient Greeks. These coffins were still occupied, still untouched, and hidden for thousands of years. The discovery has confirmed that Saqqara was the main burial site of the 26th dynasty, including the first known burial pyramid. That's a scary pyramid. Number four, Colosseum Hecklers. When the Colosseum was built in AD, AD about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman sport would just pour in. The energy here was high. This was their only source of entertainment. You know, they didn't have DVDs or anything like that. So some fans would get so into the action that they would heckle gladiators. Well, just like a comedy show, when you heckle, they too can hear you. You're throwing off their entire game and that's a no-go. It's gonna have to stop. Other people are also here trying to enjoy the same show. Today, a 19-year-old usher will ask you to keep it down a few times before kicking you out. But in Roman Colosseum days, buddy, you didn't get a warning. One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, he was a diehard fan when it came to the Colosseum and its games. So much so that one guy in the crowd heckled a gladiator one day and the emperor had him pulled from the audience and then thrown into the center of the arena. And also, no, he did not leave that arena that day. Hey Maximus, smile. Me? Number three, crappy jobs. The groom of the stool was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have in the Middle Ages, but it's one of the most important. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's behind. Yeah, and if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would also have to carry around the king's stool with him on his back, like a, like a backpack, like he's going to school, the big backpack full of poop. He would also have to monitor the king's meal times, and they would also plan their day around when they thought the king was going to experience a bowel movement. They were just gonna have to wait around until it happens. If I were the king, I would be so anxious if a little dude just started hanging out near me, he's like, hey, Bob, you feeling all right? You good? A little full? A lot of bread you ate there, eh? Why don't you take a five? Trust me. Trust me. This job was an honor to have. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king, I mean, obviously. But as time went on, these grooms' o stools became secretaries to the king, eventually getting a higher pay and benefits. Number two, Vatican secret archives. The archives are 53 miles long. There's around 35,000 volumes of catalog in them, and the Vatican secret archives are honestly no joke. They're very real. But in order to see them for yourself, it's gonna take some time. Those indexes are not public, hence why I included it in this top secret video. You're welcome. Only scholars can access them after they're 75 years old. Their official purpose is to house official paperwork and of course it's a treasure trove of anything and everything related to the Pope. It's also full of ancient documents because I mean where else do you safely store a letter from Mary Queen of Scots for example. Yeah Mary Queen of Scots was killed after serving roughly 20 years in custody but eventually she was sentenced to death for conspiring to kill Queen Elizabeth I. Before she met her fate however she wrote a letter to Pope Sixtus V literally begging for her life. But evidently the Pope did not intervene and on February 8th, 1587, Mary Queen of Scots was executed. You know, letters like that, for example. I've played too much Assassin's Creed, I think, in my life. Vatican letters? I'm on my way, Ezio. Let's do this. Number one, the less armor, the better. It's 70 AD. It's ancient Roman times. You're walking into the Colosseum. You're feeling hyped, right? You're eyeing down that eight foot six monster in front of you. His name is Gore or something terrifying. If you had to battle these guys, you would want a weapon of some sorts. A Nerf bat, give me. Like, I don't care. Literally anything. Weapons in the Colosseum were a necessity, but did you know some gladiators would use nets to fight? Nets, like they're catching butterflies. This class was referred to as the Ritari. Their combat style was built around the ways of fishermen, hence the nets. Yeah, Popeye versus Maximus. Place your bets, guys. Who's gonna get it? Popeye would for sure f*** him up. More often than not, these gladiators would use nets and a trident. How cool is that? They would take their time, too. They also wouldn't wear any armor. They'd try and keep it light and be fast. They would take their time, avoiding these mighty swings from these colossal warriors, and then eventually, you know, tire them out. And then when the time was just right, they would toss a net over them, and then proceed to poke them as hard and as fast as they could. They would poke the s*** of them. It helps to be quick, but if you've seen Game of Thrones, you know spears don't always work. Starting off at our number 10 spot, we have the tomb of Cleopatra and Mark Antony. Cleopatra was the last queen of Egypt, and for over 2,000 years, she has been quite an enigma. After losing a war and being captured by Roman Emperor Octavian, according According to ancient writers, Cleopatra ended up taking her own life in 30 BCE by having a venomous snake called an asp bite her. She was then reportedly buried in a mausoleum with Antony 
apparently with a ton of gold and riches, but no one has ever been able to find the location of this burial site. There are a ton of theories surrounding the potential location of the tomb, with some even suggesting that it may have already been found by grave robbers, who of course aren't about to disclose their findings. Many have searched areas in Alexandria, Egypt, where it is thought that her burial location would be, especially considering that this is where the palace once was, but Alexandria has seen a ton of coastal erosion over the years. This means that a lot of the land that once existed, including the land that the palace was located on, is now fully submerged in water. Experts believe it might be the largest possibility that we haven't found the tomb because it too is submerged. But there is always a chance that it is just really well hidden. At the end of the day, the location of the tomb, or I guess even the potential of its existence, remains a mystery. In our number 9 spot today, we have Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper was an unidentified serial killer who was active mostly in the impoverished areas of the Whitechapel District of London in 1888. The crimes that have been attributed to the Ripper usually were against sex workers in the area, and the things that were done to them were absolutely horrible and horrifying. While it is believed that there were 11 crimes he committed, not all of them can be solidly connected to this one criminal for certain. There are five, however, who are widely accepted as being his victims. These five are Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly. Because of some of the things that happened to three of the victims, it was believed that the perpetrator had some sort of anatomical or even surgical knowledge. When the connections between the crimes began to rise, numerous letters began to be received by both media outlets as well as Scotland Yard. The letters were of people claiming to be the killer, and the name Jack the Ripper actually originated from one of these letters. The story gained so much notoriety, and it has carried on all of these years, although the story told is usually a mix of historical research, folklore, and pseudo-history. Because of the length of time it's been, it truly is highly unlikely that we will ever find out the true identity of Jack the Ripper, but the far more important part is that we know the names of his victims so that their story may live on. In our number 8 spot today, we have the works of old men. The works of old men are structures that were first observed from the air by a British pilot in 1972, and they are located near the Azraq Oasis in Jordan. There are hundreds of these wheel-like structures that are each over 80 feet wide, some even as large as 200 feet. These huge structures have been dated back so far that they just might be the oldest man-made creations that we have ever found, which is truly unbelievable. While this is all amazing, we have absolutely no idea what they are or why they were created. The theories range from things like sun tracking to cemeteries to some sort of spiritual relevance, but we really just are not sure. While things like this are incredible finds and it's amazing that some of the first man-made things still exist on our earth, it is insane how we have no idea what they are or how to use them, and unfortunately, especially because of the fact that it's been thousands and thousands of years, it's most likely that the mysteries surrounding them are totally lost with the past. In our number 7 spot today, we have Saxe Huaman. I'm sure I said that wrong, so my apologies. This stone structure is located in Cusco, Peru, and ever since its discovery, it has been baffling historians. It was first thought that the Incans built this to be a fortress, but it is now believed that it may have actually been used for ceremonies. Despite our best guesses as to what it could have been used for, the most mysterious thing about it is how it could have been built. The stones in this structure fit together so perfectly that they stay together without anything holding them in place, and they've done this for thousands of years. While the stones fit together so well, they are also all different shapes, which has led researchers to believe that they may have kind of made up the design as they went along with the building. It is so cool to think that while they may have just been improvising and going with the flow, we're now here talking about it as one of our greatest mysteries. Also, some of the stones themselves are pretty huge, so the fact that they were also able to move them at all is quite a feat. It is very likely we'll never know exactly what the process to build this structure was like, because 
well, no one who was there is still around today. In our number six spot today, we have the Shroud of Turin. This shroud, also known as the Holy Shroud, is a linen cloth that bears the negative image of a man. If you haven't heard of it before, you might be sitting there wondering how this could possibly be mysterious, but that is because many people believe that this piece of fabric was the burial shroud that Jesus of Nazareth was wrapped in after his crucifixion. It was first mentioned in 1354, but as of recently, through things like carbon dating, it may be becoming more clear that this in fact was not the shroud of Jesus, but that still leaves us with the question, whose shroud was it? It clearly has the imprint of a man, and researchers say that the imprint features injuries that are consistent with the crucifixion process, but unfortunately in our history that wasn't necessarily an uncommon practice, so finding the answers to that question may be harder than we would like it to be. Or maybe he wasn't crucified at all, but we were just reading the signs wrong. At the end of the day, many people still view this as a religious item, and hey, maybe it actually is. I don't have the answers to this mystery, so who am I to tell you what's right? In our number five spot today, we have the Wojnik Manuscript. The Wojnik Manuscript was purchased by a Polish book dealer, Wilfred Wojnik, which is where it gets its name. He bought the mysterious manuscript from Italian Jesuits in 1912, and ever since then, it has been the source of much speculation and the kryptonite of cryptographers everywhere. The manuscript is written in some sort of lost language, and no one has ever been able to figure out either which language it is or what the manuscript says. William Friedman, who is the chief crypto analysis in the United States Army, tried to decipher what this manuscript is saying for 30 years, and even he couldn't quite crack the code. It is said that the manuscript contains information about herbal remedies, therapeutic bathing, and astrology, but what if it holds all of the answers to all of the mysteries on this list? I guess we'll never know. In our number four spot today, we have the Summerton Man. The Somerton Man was an unidentified man who was found perished on the Somerton Park Beach in South Australia in 1948. Since then, his case, who he is, and what happened to him has been a mystery plaguing authorities and all of those who are now invested in this case and its secrets. Public interest in the case arose in part due to how mysterious it was, but also because of the fact that the death occurred in a time of heightened international tension. The mysteries surrounding this one span more than just who this man Man was, however. Firstly, it is unclear how this man passed away. Was it some sort of undetectable poison? How could no one have any idea despite being able to examine the body? The next mystery is that a little secret note was found in his pocket that was torn from a book. The note in his pocket read, to mom should, which means is over or is finished. Talk about ominous, but is this note connected to the case or is it just a weird coincidence? We don't know. Earlier this year, the body of the Somerton man was actually exhumed in order for DNA testing to be done, as we, of course, have much more technology and DNA databases than we did at the time of his burial. While we haven't had any updates yet, maybe this exhumation means that this one isn't impossible to solve? I guess we'll all just have to wait and see. In our number three spot today, we have the Roman dodecahedrons. These crazy things were of course named after their 12-sided shape, but that is mostly all we know for sure about them. They seem to have been made sometime between 100 and 300 CE, and they are small, hollow objects made out of copper alloy, and each of the 12 sides has a hole in it that leads to the hollow center. The first one of these was found in 1739, and since then, about 116 similar ones have been found. They have been found in Wales, Hungary, Spain, and the most have been found in Germany and France. There has even been one found that has 20 sides. Here's the thing though, we really do not know what they were made or used for. Some assumptions are that they were candlestick holders because candle wax was found in two of them. Some think that they are dice, instruments used for measuring distances or size, a coin measuring device to determine counterfeits, and truly the list just goes on. I guess that was a long way of saying we have absolutely no idea. In our number two spot today, we have the Copper Scroll Treasure. Who doesn't love a good old fashioned treasure hunt? Well, probably the people who are searching for the Copper Scroll treasure because they simply cannot find it. The Copper Scroll is one of the Dead Sea Scrolls that was found in Cave 3 near Qumran, but it is by far the most unique. While the other scrolls were written on parchment or papyrus, this one was written on metal. And while the others were more a sort of literary work, this one features a list of 64 places that are said to be the hiding place of various items of silver and gold. The final point on the scrolls points to a 
duplicate document with more details, but that document has never been found. There are many theories as to where the treasure could be, where it came from, or if it even exists. Since it hasn't been found, it truly is tough to say. Or maybe it's already been found. Or maybe somewhere on some etheric plane, whoever made these scrolls is laughing at all of us trying to figure it out. Who knows? In our number one spot today, we have the Nazca Lines. The Nazca Lines are a group of the most famous geoglyphs that exist in the world, and they are located in the Nazca Desert in southern Peru. They were created sometime between 500 BCE and 500 CE, and we have now found tons of them, but people think that there are even more. Here's the thing that's so mysterious about them, though. We know about them because we have the technology to get a bird's eye view of the area. Whether it's through some sort of satellite, being in an airplane, or even flying a drone, we can see them and know they are there because we can see the gorgeous pictures in full view. But when they were created, that technology didn't exist, so how were they able to make these huge pictures without being able to see them from above? The designs measure between 400 to 1,100 meters across, and the group covers an area of 50 kilometers squared. It is believed that they may have been created in order for the deities in the sky to see, but that doesn't answer how, and to be honest, the reason as to why is still just a guess, as the honest answer does still remain a mystery as well. Despite how mysterious they are, they sure are stunning to look at, and I think that's something we can all appreciate. It's cool that they were somehow naturally preserved, which allows us to now be amazed at what the past humans were capable of. Number 10. The wow signal. In 1977, astronomer Jerry Elman was researching at the Ohio State University when an incredible and unexplainable radio signal was detected using the school's Big Ear telescope. In those days, information was run through what was called an IBM 1130 mainframe computer before being printed on paper and then studied by hand. Upon reviewing the findings, Jerry came across something he had never seen before. There, in a vertical column, was the sequence 6 eq U. J5. Jerry was amazed and immediately circled the sequence and wrote, wow, right beside it. Hence, the name. The signal they picked up had come from nearly 220 million light years away, and there was no explanation as to how or why a radio signal could be detected from that distance. It immediately became a sensation in both the science community and the rest of the world, and was used to support the search for alien life in the universe. Jerry himself says he's convinced that it certainly has the potential to be the first signal from extraterrestrial intelligence, and I agree. Number 9. Einstein's Last Word Words. Albert Einstein was a German-born theoretical physicist, widely acknowledged to be one of the greatest and most influential physicists of all time. Einstein is best known for developing the theory of relativity, but he also made important contributions to the development of theory of quantum mechanics. Einstein passed away at Princeton Hospital, New Jersey on April 18, 1955. He died because of internal bleeding caused by a rupture of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Einstein knew he was going to die as he refused treatment because he didn't believe in prolonging life artificially. There was a nurse present at the time of Einstein's death and she actually heard him mutter something, but she didn't know exactly what it was as she couldn't understand German. Maybe Einstein revealed an incredibly important realization or he just said goodbye to the world in his native language. But guess what? We'll never know and this will be one mystery that can't be solved. Number 8. Genghis Khan Burial Site Genghis Khan was the founder and first Khagan of the Mongol Empire, which later became the largest adjoining land empire in history. Having spent the majority of his life uniting the Mongol tribes, he launched a series of military campaigns which conquered large parts of China and Central Asia. He achieved everything he wanted, but the emperor died during the fall of Yinchuan, which is now part of China. The reasons for his death are unclear, as well as the place he was buried in. Researchers think it might be somewhere in the vicinity of the Mongol sacred mountain of Burkhan Khaldun in current North Northeastern Mongolia. According to legend, he asked to be buried without markings or any sign, and after he died, his body was returned to present day Mongolia. Marco Polo wrote that even by the 13th century, the Mongols did not know the location of the tomb. Another folkloric legend says that a river was diverted over his grave to make it impossible to find. Other tales state that his grave was stamped over by many horses, that trees were planted over the site, and that the permafrost also played its part in the hiding of the burial site. But 
to this day, we still don't know where it is. Number 7. City of Atlantis Writing in the 4th century BC, the Greek philosopher Plato told a story of a land named Atlantis that existed in the Atlantic Ocean and supposedly conquered much of Europe and Africa in prehistoric times. In the story, the prehistoric Athenians strike back against Atlantis in a conflict that ends with Atlantis vanishing beneath the waves. While no serious scholar believes that the story is literally true, they have speculated that the legend could have been inspired in part by real events that happened in Greek history. Many believe that the lost city of Atlantis story was an allegory created by Plato to illustrate the dangers of hubris and greed. In contrast, others point to evidence of ancient cultures in the Mediterranean that could have been connected to Atlantis. This story has captivated people's imaginations for centuries, with theories about its location ranging from a sunken island near the Azores to civilization in Antarctica. Despite extensive research and exploration, the truth behind Atlantis remains unknown and the mystery may never be solved. Whatever the truth, the lost city of Atlantis will likely remain a mystery for generations. Number 6. Jack the Ripper Jack the Ripper was an unidentified serial killer active in and around the Whitechapel district of London, England in the autumn of 1888. Attacks ascribed to Jack the Ripper typically involved a female night worker who lived in and worked in the east end of London. Their throats were cut prior to abdominal mutilations and the removal of internal organs from the last three of the victims led to speculation that Jack had some atomical or surgical knowledge. Rumors that the deaths were connected intensified in September and October 1888 and numerous letters were received by media outlets and Scotland Yard from individuals claiming to be responsible. The From Hell letter received by George Lusk of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee was allegedly sent from Jack the Ripper and it came with a half preserved human kidney reportedly taken from one of the victims. Now most of the reports done by the police were destroyed during World War II but what from remains we are able to learn that more than 2,000 people were interviewed, upwards of 300 people were investigated and 80 people were detained, however there was no conclusion to who the killer was. But to ease your minds, Jack the Ripper has to be dead now so no worrying about him. Number 5. Tomb of Cleopatra Ancient writers claim that Cleopatra VII and her lover Mark Antony were buried together in a tomb after their deaths in 30 BC. The writer Plutarch wrote that the tomb was located near the Temple of Isis, an ancient Egyptian goddess, and was lofty and beautiful monument containing treasures made of gold, silver, emeralds, pearls, ebony, and ivory. But the location of the tomb remains a mystery. In 2010, Hazay Hawass, Egypt's former antiques minister, conducted excavations at a site near Alexandria which contained a number of tombs dating to the era when Cleopatra ruled Egypt. While many interesting archaeological discoveries were made, Cleopatra VII's tomb was not among them. He reported in a series of news releases. Archaeologists have noted that even if Cleopatra's tomb does survive to this day, it may have been heavily plundered and unidentifiable. So it seems like nobody will be finding that treasure anytime soon. Number 4. The Copper Scroll The Copper Scroll is one of the most mysterious artifacts in history. It was discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1952 and is believed to be around 2,000 years old. The scroll consists of two copper sheets covered with a text written in ancient Hebrew script. It contains a list of 64 items or locations of hidden treasure, including gold and silver coins, sacramental vessels, and other valuable items. The scroll is not only remarkable because of its age, but also because it is the only known ancient text written on metal. This means that it has been preserved much better than other scrolls that have degraded over time. Now, Despite its incredible age, many items on the list remain a mystery and their locations have yet to be discovered. There have been many attempts to decipher the copper scroll, but no one has been able to make sense of it. Yet. Yeah. Some experts believe that the scroll could provide valuable information about the history of Jewish people in the region at the time, while others think it's simply a hoax. Whatever the case, the Copper Scroll remains one of history's greatest mysteries. Number 3. Julius Caesar's Son One of the most enduring mysteries of the Roman Empire surrounds the existence of Julius Caesar's son. Some sources claim that he was adopted by Julius Caesar and named Caesarian, while others allege that he was the illegitimate child of the Roman leader and Cleopatra. Regardless of which version of the story, 
story is authentic, there's no denying that the case of Caesarian has yet to be solved. The only evidence of his existence comes from ancient texts, which refer to him as both as an adopted son of Caesar and an illegitimate child of Cleopatra. However, none of these texts can be verified, leaving its true origin unknown. It's also unclear what became of him after Julius Caesar's assassination in 44 BC, leaving some historians to speculate that he may have had his life ended or gone into hiding. While the mystery of Caesarian may never be solved, it does make for an exciting tale to contemplate. Did he exist? What became of him? Was he ever genuinely recognized as Julius Caesar's son? These questions remain unanswered, but perhaps the truth about Caesarian will come to light one day. Number 2. The Sumerians the Sumer are the earliest known civilization that was located in the historical region of southern Mesopotamia, aka current Iraq. Sumerians were the first to use a written language, they invented a number system, the first wheeled vehicles, sun dried bricks, and irrigation for farming. But historians are not completely sure where they came from. They had an isolated language, meaning that it was not related to surrounding languages, so that makes it difficult to trace their journey. They suggest that the Sumerians may have come from North Africa, while, according to some other data, they might have originated in Caucasus. There are even more theories and it just shows how mysterious the origins of the people who created the first human civilization are. And coming in at number 1 is the Money Pit. The Oak Island Money Pit is a mysterious site on Nova Scotia's Oak Island that has been rumored to contain buried treasure. The legend of the Money Pit dates back to 1795 when three boys discovered a depression on the island and found a layer of flagstones beneath. What began as an innocent exploration quickly became a massive treasure hunt, with hundreds of searchers excavating the island for over 200 years. The money pit has been dug down more than 200 feet, but many believe that the treasure lies much more deep, like as deep as 500 feet. As the diggers have gone deeper, they've encountered multiple booby traps, such as flood tunnels and stone plugs designed to protect whatever lies at the bottom. So far, the only artifacts that have been discovered are two links of a gold chain and a stone inscribed with the letters V, I, and C, which some believe stands for Viva Christo. Despite these discoveries, the mystery of the money pit remains unsolved. Many believe it contains a great treasure, while others think it may be a hoax. While hundreds of theories have been proposed, from hidden pirate booty to ancient Native American artifacts, no one knows what lies at the bottom of Oak Island Money Pit, and I'm not sure we ever will. Coming at number 10, we have Who Killed John F. Kennedy? Okay, I know that the story in the street is that Lee Harvey Oswald was the one who killed Kennedy. That's what it says in the history books, and that's what the government has been telling us for years, even though it would seem that the story is very different. I mean, we can all accept the story that it was one dude on a grassy knoll who shot the president and then he was caught, but that is literally no fun. And there are too many red flags to think that this story played out the way that they said it did. For one, there were people who wanted JFK dead because he was starting to crack down on organized crime, and this was going to not only lose money for the mob, but also every governor and senator who had their hands in something greasy was going to lose money as well. There was also a tape that made it seem like there was a second shooter who was never caught. JFK's brain went missing before a proper autopsy could be held, which is one of the most suspicious things that I think I've ever heard in my life. Like, How do you lose track of the brain of the president who was just assassinated? And that brain could have shown if there was indeed a second shooter. On top of that, Lee Harvey Oswald was killed before he could stand trial, so we never got to hear how he pulled the whole thing off and why he did it. Then Marilyn Monroe had a mysterious overdose and people think she was killed by the CIA because they didn't want her leaking secrets and her and JFK were for sure doing the dirty deed. I mean after you hear all that super shady activity, it kind of all adds up to there's a lot the government isn't telling the public about what happened that day when JFK got shot. So to this day it all stays a secret. Coming at number 9 we have what's going on in Area 51. Just like spilled the beans on this one already, like I get it. I get why the American government can't tell us what's going on in Area 51. And it's not because it's some secret evil plan to take over the world. I mean, I'm not saying they're not doing that, but the reason that they don't show us what's going on in Area 51 has nothing to do with that. It's all national security. It's because if they do have high-tech weapons and ships in there that can take over the world and blow things up and fly faster than any ship we've ever seen, and all these things are being built with the help of aliens, then you can't let everyone know because then Russia and China and every other superpower in the world will want to start doing the same thing, and then your secret weapon is no longer a secret, and your country no longer has an edge when war breaks out. And trust me, it's a nice place to be sitting when you know you have an edge on the competition when it comes to war. But how about instead of showing everyone in the world what's going on in Area 51, you just show me. Just bring me in and I won't tell anyone. I promise. I just want to know what's going on.
going on? I'll keep my mouth shut and I won't spill any Illuminati secrets. I promise. Coming in number eight, we have the recipe for Roman concrete. Even though we wouldn't do anything with this today because we've got much better tech, it would seem that the Romans had a recipe for concrete that would allow them to build things that would stand for thousands of years. Actually, on second thought, we could use that recipe because nothing made today lasts that long. But whatever they were mixing, we have no idea what went into it. People suspect that they were using volcanic ash and salt water the mix, but that's about as far as we've gotten. Coming in at number seven, we have Hitler's body. The world's most hated man is for sure dead now, but there was a time when people thought he could have still been alive because as far as I know, no one ever saw his dead body. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this. You don't want someone like Hitler to be worshipped, so you don't want to bury him in somewhere where people can find and then congregate around it, but other people think that there was no body because he actually escaped and then lived out his years in South America. Ho ho! Coming in at number six, we have the KFC recipe. Probably one of the most valuable things that has ever been made besides the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The KFC recipe has never been revealed and that's actually shocking. How has no one been able to break this down after all this time? I mean, we have machines that can break down molecules of anything, so how can't we find out what the recipe is made of? I think we have that technology. I might have just seen that in a sci-fi movie and now my brain is mistaking it for real life. But the recipe that was made in the 1940s and the official paper that has the full breakdown is locked away back at the KFC headquarters in Louisville. To try and steal this thing, you would need like six Ocean Eleven teams and 50% of them would die in the process. That thing is locked up tight. Apparently only two people on the planet know what actually goes into the chicken and no one in the world even knows who those people are. So they can never be kidnapped and forced to spill the goods. And they don't even know who each other are. That is some secret stuff. Next on the list we have oil deposits in America. How much oil is on American land? Well we have no idea. That is something that the American government has been working very hard to keep under wraps. They don't want anyone to find out how much oil they actually have because then they can have more power on the market and dictate how the future oil prices move. Also, you don't want to show your cards until you have to. So until it's beneficial for the American government to disclose that information, they are not going to do so. The rumor is if you buy land and find an oil deposit under it, the American government will pay you tons of money for that oil and also pay you to keep your mouth shut about the fact that there is an oil deposit under your land. Next on the list, we have the Coca-Cola recipe. Probably the only thing more valuable than the KFC recipe on the planet and it is the Coca-Cola recipe. I know I said it was the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but things have changed since the last point, okay? This recipe has been under lock and key since its inception, and for good reason. Even though I can't tell the difference between Coke or Pepsi, some people say that they can, and those people are probably geniuses that would freak out if the recipe ever got leaked, because then Coke would be on every corner in the world, like it already is. Well, much like the KFC recipe, only two people know what the Coke recipe is at any given time. And guess what? I know the secret ingredient for coke. It's sugar. That's really the backbone of the whole project. Alright guys, next on the list we have Who is Anonymous? The world famous hacker group will pop up every now and again when wrongs need to be corrected in the world. But we still have no idea who this group of people is. They could really be anyone. I could be one of them. Not really. I barely know how to spell. I couldn't code. But we do know that they are constantly active. Last time they sprung up was during the BLM protests in America and they apparently leaked some pretty saucy documents. Coming in Number two guys, we got how the pyramids were built. I mean, this might be the greatest mystery of all, but it's only at number two, so clearly not. But to this day, we are not convinced on one way or the other of how the pyramids were built. Some say it might have been aliens that came down to build them for the pharaohs. Other people think it could have been technology that was simply lost in time, similar to the Roman concrete. But what it probably was, was just manpower. They had a lot of people working on one thing with no rest, and eventually, you get a big triangle in the middle of the desert. And finally on the number one spot we have the tomb of Genghis Khan. So you know that dude who caused the deaths of more people than anyone who has ever existed? The guy who built the biggest empire the world has ever seen. The guy who was able to topple kings and queens, emperors and shahs, killed some of the most powerful people of that time without breaking a sweat. Yeah that dude, no one knows where he's buried. It was a request of the great Khan to be buried where no one could find him. So the story goes he was buried somewhere on the Burkhan Kaldan mountain. This is apparently the place where he was born as well, but we have no idea if that was even the right place because after he was buried, everyone who was involved was executed 
executed. That way no one could ever answer as to where his body was. On top of this they apparently let 1000 horses run wild through the mountains so no tracker could follow the tracks back to where the tomb was. Yeah it's safe to say that this guys body is gone forever. It's because he didn't want to be worshipped after his death. He didn't want to be a Jesus like figure and even though he was one of the most horrible people who ever lived that for sure could have happened. Many people thought he had some sort of supernatural power because of how he was able to conquer so much of the world. In our number 10 spot we have the Moko Mokai collection. Well, we are starting off strong with a truly scary and disturbing photo. This is a photograph of a man named Major General Horatio Gordon Robley, who had a collection of 35 heads that he stole from the native Maori people. Apparently in New Zealand, there were people called Maori that preserved the heads of fallen people. The heads were chopped off, boiled, smoked, dried in the sun, and then dipped in a shark oil before being displayed like a trophy. Whoa. They are known as the Moko Mokai. Anyways, these heads were robbed by the British when they moved into New Zealand, and this pic is one of the guys who stole them. Honestly, the man feels just as chilling to look at as the heads. Does anyone else agree? It's probably because he's holding something that looks like it could be a sharp object that might have helped in the chopping process. I don't know, could be just me. In our number 9 spot we have the woman in the attic. Well. The story behind this picture is extremely chilling, so chilling that I definitely threw on some show tunes and sang for a moment after reading about it. In case you're curious, Wicked is always my musical of choice. Speaking of Wicked, this was not planned, I swear. The woman in this photograph is a real woman who had a wicked mother who locked her in an attic for 25 years. An anonymous tip to the authorities in 1901 was how she was found, 55 pounds in a room filled with feces, old meat, and insects. Thankfully she was okay health wise, but mentally as you can expect, not so much. This is a photo of her and how she was found. Truly horrible to see. While nothing while looking at this photograph and seeing her long brown hair, I'm now convinced that this is where Disney got some of their inspiration for the movie Tangled. There are way too many similarities that I'm sure they took and made a thousand times more light and cheery. In our number 8 spot we have For Sale. This is a photograph from 1948 that honestly at first glance I thought it to be some kind of joke. Maybe the young ones in the photograph were being bad and the mum was threatening to sell them. You know, the old tricks parents would play when children's age wasn't a phone call away. Anyways, apparently this is a picture of something very real that was happening due to poverty at the time and that instantly makes the picture chilling and sad. Apparently the mother and father of these young ones, Mr. and Mrs. Chalifo, needed money desperately and so they sold them. It was said that the mother was paid to stage this photo and perhaps that is why there is an air of phoniness to it, but no later than two years after all of their young ones had been sold to families. In in our number 7 spot we have On the Brink of Death. A man by the name of Robert Overacker decided that he wanted to raise awareness for the homeless. And how was he going to do it? Oh by doing a stunt that would attract the masses. He was going to jet ski over Niagara Falls. And this is a picture of him doing just that. This was the last picture of him taken as he fell to his death as his parachute did not open as planned. Apparently one of the police officers at the Niagara area has said that it would have been like hitting cement as he fell 180 feet. Wow. What a haunting photo to look at. He was only 39 as well. This is why I will never skydive because well there isn't a 100% survival rate so there's that. Also. I'm a chicken, so there's also that. In our number 6 we have the two headed dog. I always feel like puking when I see this photo. It is just the most inhumane thing ever and it makes my heart hurt to look at. This is a photo that was taken in the 50s of the Soviet scientist Vladimir Demikov and his science experiment, the two headed dog. He beheaded the head off of one of the dogs and attached it to the other dog. He sewed their circulatory systems together and connected their vertebrae with plastic strings and after the surgery was completed, both of the heads could hear, see, smell and act as a normal dog would. 
The dog survived only four days before passing away. This scientist's research led to the creation of transplants, but wow, was this a horrible thing to have done. Also, he apparently only did this experiment due to boredom, so perhaps my anger stems from having learned that. In our number five spot, we have Mary Reeser. This is a picture of a blown up Mary Reeser. This picture showcased quite the story from its time. On July the 2nd of 1951 in St. Petersburg, Florida, a woman by the name of Mary Reeser somehow caught fire and all that remained was a part of her skull and her left leg surrounded by her ashes. She was discovered by her landlady and after the investigation, the police were unable to say as to how she could have possibly caught fire. It was this story where the idea of spontaneous human combustion was theorized, but scientists today say that they are almost certain that this could not be the case. But what is weird is that most of her house was largely devoid of fire damage, so it makes no sense. I suppose we shall never know and this picture will continue to scare us till the end of time. In our number four spot, we have the truck stop killer. In the 70s, there was a killer by the name of Robert Ben Rhodes who would pick up while he was driving his commercial truck across America and then he would kill them. He was suspected to have taken the life of over 50 women. Anyways, when he was finally caught, a picture of a named Regina K. Walters was found along with many other photos of women inside Robert's home. This photo is believed to be taken right before he killed Regina. Man, oh man, how horrible. This is quite chilling to look at. Sometimes I'm so surprised when evidence like this is leaked to the public. This must have been haunting for her family and friends to see. In our number three spot, we have the Radium Girls. This is another chilling photo of a girl that was a part of the Radium Girls, which were a number of women known for working at factories in the 20s where they were exposed to so much radium that they actually would come home glowing in the dark. Unfortunately, the prolonged exposure caused them to have a series of problems such as their jaws began to swell up and fell off, their vertebrae would collapse, and eventually they passed of cancer. So knowing that this is a pic of one of those women makes this picture so much worse than it looks. However, it does already look like a scary picture of a woman in pain. Pretty scary to think about the amount of people working in factories today or working with technology that might bring about future death that we haven't been able to predict yet. In our number two spot, we have Annalise Michelle. Yeah, this picture will definitely give you the heebie-jeebies even without knowing the backstory. But what if I told you that this is a pic of a woman that was believed to be possessed by the devil? Yeah, this photo just got a hundred times scarier, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, this is a photo of a young lady by the name of Annalise, and she was a pretty devout Catholic German and grew up in the 60s. She was completely normal until she suddenly started hallucinating, eating spiders, routinely convulsing, and oh, just drinking her own urine. She claimed that the devil was possessing her, and she would later go on to have 67 exorcisms. Nothing worked, and she ended up passing away from malnutrition at the age of 23. Her tale is what inspired the movie The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Yep, deeply chilling. In our number one spot, we have The Pioneer's Defense. Save the best for last. This is probably one of the creepiest photos that I have ever seen. This is a historical image taken by the Russian photographer Viktor Bula in 1937. If it isn't creepy enough without the explanation, Here's the explanation. These are people that were part of a Soviet youth group called the Young Pioneers, and they are wearing gas masks because they were in the middle of a military preparation drill, as this was during a time when Joseph Stalin was the dictator and no one knew if death was around the corner. Yikes. Sometimes I am so, so thankful to be alive right now, even though it does seem as if we're going through a bit of a mental war in this day and age, a physical war is way scary to think about being a part of. Shall we? Starting us off at number 10 is the Judas Cradle. The medieval times are known for a lot of stuff, and one of those is their insanely gruesome torture devices. Back then, if you'd found out you were facing the guillotine, you could actually breathe a sigh of relief, because trust me, there were far worse ways to die. One of these horrific devices was called a Judas Cradle, and was used to interrogate prospective criminals into talking, and often would result in their death one way or another. Victims that face this torture would be 
stripped of their clothing, bound, and then lowered slowly onto a pyramid shaped spike that depending on your downstairs parts would be aimed at different areas I'll just say. Any movement at all would only make the pain worse so if you weren't telling them what they wanted to hear they would often rock the victim back and forth tearing them further open and they would keep victims here as long as it took. Sometimes even overnight. But what about the death part? Well if you didn't die from injuries received during the tour or frankly just blood loss, then most died from infection. You see the spike was never really cleaned, so there was a whole horde of bacteria and disease that would settle onto the spike, inevitably seeping into the victim's nether regions. Ah, how fun, right? <laughs> Next up at number 9 is cruentation. The Middle Ages had many interesting ways to handle justice, much of which I think we are all incredibly grateful is illegal nowadays. One of these such practices was called cruentation. Essentially back then they believed that corpses retained a tiny spark of life after death and so they were therefore revered as magical entities. Just imagining that they saw rigor mortis and decided that the corpse was somehow still alive. But how did this involve their judicial system? Well, with the idea of using the corpse's magical powers to their advantage, they would place an accused killer in contact with the corpse of their alleged victim. And if the corpse started spontaneously bleeding when the convict was in its presence, it was seen as confirmed evidence that they were guilty of the crime. This actually remained a completely legal practice until the late 17th century. But thankfully somewhere down the line they figured out that maybe a dead bleeding body couldn't be used as proof to convict someone of killing. Next up at number 8 is slug soup. Listen, I love just about all the creatures on the planet and I don't have it out for slugs or anything, but I have never been able to look at one without feeling nauseous. So this actually sounds like a personal version of hell to me. During the crusade battles, Muslims became popular for using aconite to poison the crusaders. This was obviously causing quite an issue as at the time there was no known cure. That was until one day when 14th century doctor Guido de Vigavano noticed some slugs munching away on an aconite leaf and he had the biggest light bulb moment of his career. He collected slugs and boiled them before using the boiled sludge and turning it into a soup. First he tested it on animals and after successful results there he decided to try it out for himself. After a bit of trial and error it turned out to make quite a successful antidote to the poison. But man oh man does it sound incredibly disgusting. But still better than being poisoned I guess. <laughs> Coming in at number 7 are transy tombs. In the middle ages the practice of memento mori meaning remember you must die was huge. Memento mori was practiced in many ways, open caskets, churches filled with skeletons of the dead and years later developed into things like photographing the dead. Their keen attachment to this philosophy likely stemmed from the sheer amount of people dying so frequently due to the overall lack of hygiene so they had to come to terms with death in a much more peaceful sense than maybe we do now. One of their favorite ways to practice memento mori however was with transy tombs, which were funerary monuments that depicted the deceased in a stage of eerie decomposition. As you can imagine they were costly so usually they could only be resurrected after those with high standing or small fortune in the bank. At the time there was an existing belief that the earthly body was merely a transition vessel of the soul and that after death the spirit would be resurrected. And so in creating these tombs that resembled the decomposing dead, they figured it would help the soul move on more quickly. And while I'm not opposed to all of the reasons behind it, from the modern lens it is a bit morbid to have statues not only resembling the dead but looking like zombies lining the streets and I'm just glad this practice went out of fashion. Coming in at number 6 is bloodletting. Back in the day the medical practice of bloodletting was used by medieval physicians as they believed it would literally let the bad blood out of the body. This belief is mostly derived from the Greek physician Hippocrates and his theory of the four humors. The four humoral theory centered around the belief that inside the body Body, there are four main humors or liquids. Black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. And that any imbalance in these liquids was what caused health issues or even changes in temperament. So where bloodletting came in was that there was this belief you could let out blood in order to balance out these liquids in your body again. Now while this theory was definitely a stepping stone in modern medicine, many argue could be considered a precursor to blood transfusions, the way that it was being done was 
was without any real scientific backing, and without any understanding of just how much blood was safe to let out or from what vein or artery was the safest. For example, people were so into the practice at the time that they would base which day was best for bloodletting on texts, usually advising to pick a saint's day. It was also popular to rely on charts showing which parts of the body were best to bleed from according to their zodiac. So as you can imagine, the practice did not always end well. Coming in at number 5 is Saint Francesca Romana. During medieval times, fornication in any other context than between a man and his wife and for the purposes of procreation was considered a sin, punishable by life in prison. Now of course there were many many people that did not take this to heart, but there was one woman who very much did, Francesca Romana. For as long as Romana could recall, she always wanted to become a nun when she got older, but as happened all too frequently back then, her father forced her into marriage at the age of 13 as the man in question was extremely wealthy. At first she was incredibly reluctant, but after she allegedly received a vision from Saint Alexis, she changed her tune and became a dutiful wife, and even perhaps grew to like her husband. But this didn't change Romana's belief about the sins revolving what went on in the marital bed. So in private, wishing to remain spiritually chaste even if she couldn't be in her physical body, she would heat pork fat and burn her nether regions to ensure that she would remain in extreme pain throughout the act and never enjoy a minute of it. This was the only way she believed she could commit the act without sin and remain in the good graces with God. <laughs> Coming in at number 4 is an arthritis cure. This one actually blew my mind when I first came across it. According to an 1896 news story in the Smithsonian, one day a drunk man was on a beach with some of his friends when he spotted a rotting whale carcass. Because he was drunk, he thought it would be super funny to dive right into it. And he did. His friends waited for him and finally he came out, but he reported something incredibly strange. That his rheumatoid arthritis was seemingly gone. This sparked a national craze in Australia, and once word got out about the healing powers of the whale carcass, the town of Eden became a worldwide destination for people suffering from the condition. Visitors would be lowered into a freshly dead whale through a hole which would be sewn up, and it was advertised that if the person could stay inside for 20 to 30 hours, they would be cured of their pain. I have to imagine that you would need to be in so much pain to give this a try in the first place, because the thought of spending an entire day inside of a dead whale just seems wild. That being said, it's not all a bunch of hogwash. There is reason to believe that the rotting whale would have acted like a sweat box of sorts, potentially relieving some of the pain, but truthfully I don't see how this could cause any kind of permanent fix. Let's just be grateful there are some other options out there today. Coming in at number 3 is a brutal execution. As has already been established, one of medieval Europe's most notorious strengths was figuring out the most gruesome way to either torture or kill their citizens. And if you thought that the Judas Cradle was bad, then wait until you hear about this one. To be hanged, drawn, and quartered was a method of execution far worse than any other. At least with practices like the guillotine, it's over quickly enough, but with this one it was quite literally drawn out just to make you suffer. First off, the victim would be tied to a wooden panel and dragged, or drawn, behind a horse to their place of execution. Second, they would be hanged until the point right before before they died, then they would mutilate the body often by disembowelment or emasculating it while they were still alive before finally beheading them and quartering the body, meaning cutting it into four pieces. It was intentionally excessive as this was a punishment saved for those who committed high treason against the king and was used to instill compliance and fear in the onlookers. It was most popular in 14th century England, although it remained in the rotation of choices until it was abolished in 18. Coming in at number 2 are changelings. Across Europe there was an old belief in changelings, which were thought to be evil creatures left in place of young ones stolen by fairies. This was a huge problem for many reasons. Number 1, it was 
objectively not happening. You see, the main reason that parents believed their little ones had been swapped with a changeling was that their young ones suddenly fell ill, had physical deformities, behavioral changes like advanced knowledge beyond their years, or being mischievous. So essentially, if the young person in question got sick, became intelligent, had a disability, or acted like a normal developing person in any way, it was viewed as a changeling. Tragically, once it was believed that a changeling imposter was in their arms, there was only one way to handle the situation. Heard it in hopes that the fairies would come save the changeling and they would give their real one back. They did things like exorcisms, leaving them in the cold, poisoning them, or even trying to end their lives. And they believed that in doing this, their real little one would be returned to them. It may just be one of the saddest and most cruel practices to have ever existed. And last up in our number one spot are Ivy League photos. If you thought there was corruption in the high ranking areas of society before this, then buckle up because this one might be one of the most insane things I've ever heard. Apparently for some time it was actually required for students enrolling in Ivy League schools to have their photos taken in a grotesquely inappropriate fashion. To put it delicately, you are not allowed to be dressed. This dark underbelly came to light in the 1970s when a Yale employee opened a long locked room and discovered thousands of photos dating back several decades. It was then uncovered that between the 40s to the 60s, it was a requirement to submit what they called posture photos, which were taken from every single angle and forced the subjects to attach pins to their spines under the guise of studying their spines. Some schools, however, practiced longer. Harvard, for example, began in the 1880s and got away with it until the 20th century. Of course, there was a huge investigation about this, and they found that the photos were used in various studies for big tobacco, or that they would use them in books for illustrations, but the creepiest was a professor that admitted the photos were used for anthropological research and were used to study the connection between a student's body type and their intelligence in what was basically glorified eugenics. Thankfully, most of these photos have since been burned, however, for some reason there are some that remain at the Smithsonian. I'm just grateful the practice of mandatory nude photos is banned because actually what the, <laughs> what the heck is that? Starting off at number 10, vampire killings. So starting us off, we have the supposed vampire killings from the 1800s. Now, spoiler alert here, they weren't actually vampires. Well, I guess I don't know that for sure, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say they weren't. Anyways, back in the 1800s, people in New England believed that cadavers were rising from their graves at night and preying on the living. So to solve this problem, they began exhuming the cadaver now, some kept it simple and just turned the cadaver face down, but others jumped to more extreme methods like ripping the bones apart and rearranging them, or burning the deceased person's heart and inhaling the smoke. Apparently at the time, it was believed inhaling the smoke cured tuberculosis, though I can only imagine it made matters much worse for them. Some towns were so into the ritual that they would even hold festivals during the process and celebrate the exhumation and subsequent destruction of the corpses altogether. So while it was incredibly unsettling, they did truly believe they were vampires haunting them in the night, so I guess it gave them some peace of mind. Next up at number 9, dentures. While today dentures are made from composite resin or sometimes porcelain, during the 18th and 19th centuries, of course, those materials weren't available. But as you can imagine, people were still losing teeth at an even higher rate due to the high sugar diet attempted teeth whitening, which was really just wearing away their enamel instead of brightening it, and the overall lack of knowledge around hygiene. So dentures were still needed and wanted by many. So what was their material of choice? Well, for the easiest and most profitable route, many would acquire the teeth from dead bodies. Although if you had some money, you might be able to afford dentures made from ivory. Other materials were sometimes the teeth of animals or wood, but honestly, I think we can all agree that none of those sound like terribly sanitary options, considering
considering professional physicians at the time weren't sterilizing instruments and some didn't even believe in disinfecting prior to surgery. Next up at number 8, stained glass. If you walk into just about any old church, you'll notice the walls are decorated with beautiful stained glass. But what might surprise you is that in some of the particularly older pieces, there is a strange ingredient that helps it all come together. In 1112, a German monk wrote about the process of creating the beautifully colored glass, and as he detailed, it starts off innocently enough, adding sand and potash at a high temp until it becomes molten. From there, they'd add a stabilizer before coloring the glass with different metallic oxides like copper, cobalt, and gold. But once the glass was cooled and shaped, the small details were added by paint. They made the paint usually from lead or copper and would then suspend it in urine. So quite literally, some of those old stained glass windows were painted with pea paint, which I mean kind of just makes me giggle if I'm honest, but it is definitely a weird ingredient to think about being in paint. Coming in at number 7, leather bound books. Nowadays it's unusual to even find real leather on anything, but once upon a time the leather on books wasn't even from cows, it was from people. Called anthropodermic bibliopegy, the books were made in a similar way as they would now, but obviously with one huge difference. They used human skin instead of an animal. While there are actually only 18 confirmed books of its kind that still exist, we have no idea just how many there could have been all those years ago. Allegedly the books were usually made from executed convicts, and during the French Revolution there were rumors that a tannery for human skin was established outside of Paris. I mean it kind of gives me the willies to think about it and I'm just glad we've moved on to a different material to bind our books today. Next up at number 6, Minnie Dean. Wilhelmina Dean, or Minnie as she was often referred to, was a nanny in New Zealand during 1880 and was a well known caretaker in her town. But something was off with the woman and soon she began having quite the dark spot on her name and career. In 1889, one of the young people under her care suddenly died, as if out of nowhere, and initially it was viewed as a freak accident, but two years later the same thing happened again. Now with two minors perished under her care, police decided to investigate further into the matter. After a bit of sleuthing, it was concluded that under Minnie's care, the two minors were as she was attempting to take out life insurance on them. Police immediately took the remaining young boy in her care, finding it in dirty clothes and drinking curdled milk. By 1895, the investigation into her crimes continued and she was spotted trying to flee on a train with another victim in her arms. And when police searched her house, they found three more covered up victims. Eventually found guilty for all her crimes, she was the first and only woman ever hanged in New Zealand. Next up at number 5, Radiation Test Subject. In 1999, a man named Hisachi Uchi was a power plant technician and he became known for being exposed to the highest amount of radiation of any human in history. While working at the Tokamura nuclear power plant, after a lack of safety protocols, improper training, and just an overall pressure to meet deadlines, Uchi and his co-workers made a terrible error. They mistakenly mixed an incorrect measurement of radioactive materials into the wrong tank, and as you've probably figured out, it caused a near fatal burst of gamma rays. Hisashi, who happened to be the closest to the incident, was brutally injured and sent to the hospital. Once he was there, it was discovered he had no more white blood cells, so essentially meaning that he had no remaining immune system. And despite being in intense pain with a rapidly deteriorating condition, doctors kept him alive under the family's request. So for 83 days, Uchi remained alive, being used as a test subject for experimental radiation treatment by the doctors, which, I mean, in their defense, was the request of the family, but still, he endured several cardiac arrests, lost all of his skin, and suffered brain damage as well as organ failure. One of the last things Uchi ever said was, 
quote, I can't take it anymore, I'm not a guinea pig. And then finally, one more cardiac arrest released him from his torture. Coming in at number 4, Mamiya. Most widely practiced between the 12th to the 17th century, although there were a few cases in the 18th century that pop up, Mamiya was widely used as a means of medicine in many European countries. Now if you can't tell by the name, Mamiya is creepily just as it sounds, the use of human remains to fix a living person's ailments. It was believed by many of the top physicians at the time that ingesting certain remains prompted the medicinal power of the mummy and could cure things like coagulated blood, pain, coughs, inflammation, cramps, and even heal open wounds. Now, they didn't just sit around eating the carcass directly, instead they would either grind the bones into a powder and drink it from there, or drink an extracted liquid from the embalmed individual. In fact, it was so popular at one point that it's believed the reason there are so few mummies these days is because of the high demand of flesh at the time. Coming in at number 3, James Jameson. One of the heirs to the Jameson whiskey family fortune, Jameson considered himself to be an adventurer of sorts and often traveled to far off lands detailing the trips in his diary. In 1888, Jameson decided to head out to explore the Congo, and while there he wrote about and demanded some gruesome things from the locals. So before beginning this expedition, Jameson discovered that the area he was visiting was known to have a population that participated in the eating of other humans. Apparently Jameson set out to witness it firsthand, which I mean, why was that his dream? A little suspicious if you ask me, but I digress. According to Assad Faran, who was his translator for the trip, Jameson bought a girl from a trader of slaves for a few handkerchiefs and gave her over to the tribe to be eaten. Allegedly, he didn't pay the tribe directly, but in a roundabout way, he did sort of pay to have this girl c What's even more gross is that he proceeded to draw and paint watercolors of the gruesome event while it happened. Which again, just wrong on so many levels. Coming in at number 2, Cambodian Barbies. You may have been taught about the Khmer Rouge in history class, but if they don't ring a bell, essentially they were an extreme communist regime in Cambodia that held government between 1975 to 1979. They were known for being extremely cruel and committed some of the most horrifying acts of genocide in history, with nearly 2 million perishing under their ruling. Now, during their radical rule, the entire country was isolated from all foreign influences. This included closing schools, hospitals, factories, banks, foreign agriculture. They believed this would stimulate the rebirth of the country, but of course, all it did was send it into desolate famine and poverty. Led by a man named Pol Pot, the people of the country could not forage for food, despite the fact that everyone was starving, and anyone who disobeyed the orders was killed. Apparently, as the people became more and more desperate, they began to turn to folk magic, turning Barbie dolls into smoking talismans for luck. Thankfully, since its dissolution in 1999, all the leaders have been jailed for their atrocities and the people are freed from the genocidal regime. And last up in our number one spot, the rabbit woman. Her name was Mary Toft, and in 1726, she became known throughout Surrey, England, as having been the woman who gave birth to rabbits. Now, I know what you're thinking, that isn't possible. And you would be right. But still, the story of how she convinced people it was real was crazy. Apparently, Toft was actually pregnant at one point, but miscarried, and it could have been this that sent her into her madness. Madness. Toft began declaring that she was giving birth to various animal parts, and so her local doctor became involved in the case. At first, everyone actually believed her, as in fact, a rabbit did, well, come out of her. And with a doctor backing up her claims, the king and his royal surgeon got involved. Unlike her local doctor, the king's surgeon was skeptical, and after discovering corn inside the stomach of one of the rabbits and hay in their droppings, it proved the animal hadn't developed inside Mary. Eventually, Mary Toft admitted to the hoax and explained that she had manually inserted the animals inside her to make the delivery as realistic as possible. She was immediately imprisoned for fraud, and the medical community was ridiculed for having been fooled. Mm -hmm. 